This is the Military Bottom Line Podcast, episode 83. And I was like, how many people are planning on getting out of the military? And only a few raised their hands. And I was like, everyone should have raised their hands because everyone's getting out of the military. Mm, Unless you die, you know, in service, you're getting out of the military. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, five years from now, tomorrow or 20 years from now, you're getting out of the military and you're going to have to figure that out. And, you know, the day you start preparing is when you realize that's going to happen. Welcome to the Military Bottom Line Podcast, where we learn from veterans and those currently serving how to make the most out of a military contract. We are here to motivate, inspire, and help you leverage your service to positively impact you professionally, personally, and financially during your military career and beyond. What's going on, everybody? Thanks so much for tuning in today. It has been a little while since we've done an interview podcast, and I'm super grateful for you guys tuning in. I hope you enjoyed your holidays as we get back off to uh, a new year, 2023. Hopefully, we'll be increasing the uh, the rate at which we put out these podcasts and these interviews. And I'm really excited to introduce to you guys today, John Davis. John is a U.S. Army infantry veteran who did two combat tours to Afghanistan and has since graduated from Harvard University. He is a veteran advocate and doing everything he can to help student veterans uh, through their transition from the military to college. And so John uh, today is here to talk about his experiences, but more specifically to talk about his book, Combat to College, which is a fantastic piece that he put together, compiling all his lessons Uh, from his experience, but also lessons he learned from other people's experiences for those that are uh, leaving the military and going into college using their GI Bill. So I really hope you guys stick around to hear his wisdom, his advice, um, and hopefully it really inspires you to actually try out his book, which I highly recommend if you are on track to use your GI Bill and uh, gain a college education. So stay tuned and enjoy the episode. John Davis, welcome. Thanks for joining me today, man. Yeah, I'm pumped to be here, Jason. Dude, congratulations on the release of your your new book, Combat to College. That's a, a huge accomplishment. Yeah, it was actually the it was kind of cool because I got to rewrite it. I wrote the first edition by myself. I think I said the F word like 35 <laughs> times in it. Yeah. And then I got uh, picked up by a publisher and they wanted to do a second edition. And so getting the opportunity to kind of rewrite it and work with professionals was really a cool experience. Awesome, man. Yeah, I was reading through it and I was like, man, this is like relatively clean compared to what I was expecting. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, the first I, one I did totally on my own, you know, yeah. my own editing, my own design, all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I kind of I never had the idea to be a writer. Uh, mm-hmm. I just had the idea to help student veterans. Awesome, man. Yeah, I think it's it's got a, a tasteful number of F-bombs in there and some good uh, <laughs> military rhetoric. But so I think it's it's a nice transition book for kind of vets to figure out like, all right, how should I be learning how to talk and communicate in the professional world? So I think you did a good job. Yeah, that was one thing I struggled with. I remember going when my first week in school, I was sitting in the classroom and the professor asked me to stay after like, John, I love your energy. I love, you know, just patient, but you have to watch the language. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you said the <laughs> F word like four times today. Yeah. I was like, ah, I'm so used to that. It's how we talk, you know, and uh, you know, I like talking about like the military habits you take forward and military mm-hmm. habits you leave behind totally. and cursing every other word is pretty common in the military, but not so, not so, uh, it's frowned upon in corporate culture. Yeah. Yeah. It gets to a point where it's, um, it's just a little bit overboard. <laughs> so <laughs> you like can shock it. people with that, you know, with some of the dark humor stuff and cursing, yeah. it can really be surprising. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very true. Well, let's let's get a little backstory about kind of how you got here, how you ended up writing a book, um, you know, where you're from, why you ended up joining the army in the first place, and kind of give us a brief story. Yeah, I grew up in Iowa, and I originally went to school to be a firefighter. I thought that would kind of be a cool thing to do, you know, especially when you grew up kind of in the wake of 9-11, um, seeing the firefighters and heroes and things like that. So I went to school for fire science, and then once I get into the program and you kind of like take trips to firehouses and stuff like that, I realized firefighters kind of sit around a lot, mm. which not a knock on firefighters as part of the job. Yeah. But, you know, I went there and these guys are just they're working out. They're talking about what to cook, you know, yeah. then they're going to car accidents and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I pictured myself like 
kicking down the doors of burning buildings, carrying out babies, oh, yeah. you know, that kind of fire firefighter stuff. And that's when I realized that that kind of lifestyle wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be more proactive and not necessarily reactive. Mm-hmm. So that kind of led me to talking to the branches of the military and joining the army. Um, I think that was like 2008. Okay. And then, uh, you know, from there on out, I, I had a good, I had a good experience in the military. Uh, I think most people do. I think the service is something that grows you, you know, whether you serve three years or 30 years, there's things you can take forward from it. Um, so my military career, I was infantryman in the army and I spent my last two years recruiting. Oh, okay. By choice or? <laughs> no, okay. I actually, that's kind of why I got out of the military because yeah. I, I felt, <laughs> I felt betrayed by the army. I was like, I love the army. I feel like I'm good at it. Why are you sending me to talk to high school kids? Because yeah. that's just, obviously, when I joined the Army, I didn't even know they could make me be a recruiter. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, I joined with a recruiter. But, you know, when you sign your contract for infantry, I, I didn't know they could just be like, okay, now yeah. you're going to New York, a place you've never been to be a recruiter. No kidding. How long was your contract, your initial contract? Uh, five years. Five years. Okay, so you got three infantry and two as a recruiter. Well, I got, I did five years. My initial contract was five years and I re-enlisted and then they hit me with recruiting orders. So I ended got up doing it. eight years. Got it. Got it, man. So that's, uh, were you, were you thinking you were going to be a, a, a lifer or at least like, yeah, you were, I was, I was all kind of set up with kind of my career path. One of the things about the military is you have this kind of like linear career path where it's like, you know, you take these positions, you do these deployments. Um, and then I had re-enlisted and then right away orders for recruiting mm. recruiting school and i had just got just got promoted to e6 and i you know envisioned my career in a different direction and then yeah. when you're put in recruiting you're kind of so cut off from the real military yeah. Yeah. it's just it's a totally separate type of a thing yeah. and so i really lost the kind of community and the things i loved about the military uh and then obviously i had to talk to a lot of high school kids which is terrible totally totally yeah it's a little bit of an oversight on the military's part it's like all right take somebody that's stoked about the military well, I guess it kind of makes sense because then you'd think they'd be good recruiters, <laughs> but you know, for them to ruin your plans of being a lifer, I'm, I'm sure they would have, uh, you know, that's how it goes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So. And of course there's, you know, the military does with you what they want. I mean, yeah. you're kind of a cog in the machine and totally. I enjoyed a lot of aspects about recruiting. I mean, but like the last year of it, I was kind of like giving up. I was like, I'm gonna go see a movie during the day. Like, you know, maybe yeah. see some of the joint at the movie theater. Totally. It's that recruiting <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, so at, at, then at, your, your plans obviously changed in that second contract and like wh- how far out of your, at the, how far from the end of your second contract did you start to think, all right, maybe I'm done. Maybe I need to start preparing for the next thing. I think it was kind of made the decision to get out when one, I kind of saw some of the things the military was doing, the directions they're moving in mm. and I saw the coming to the end of the war on terror and things like that. And I had joined for challenges. That's kind of what I yeah. wanted to do was kind of be challenged and have adventure. And I saw the military kind of becoming maybe less of an adventure mm. in, in certain ways, or at least it was to me kind of like the unknown was more of an adventure than the military, yeah. which I kind of felt like I knew. Yeah. And when I was in Afghanistan, one of the things that I really enjoyed and really had a huge impact on me was I got to work on a team helping open up co-ed schools. So kind of seeing that kind of like the gender discrimination in education, seeing all the crazy things in education in Afghanistan made me want to be a teacher. So I got mm-hmm. out of school um, or when I got out of the military, I went to school right away to become a teacher. No kidding. OK. And I know, you know, I don't want to give too many things away in your book, but um, you, specifically history was your intent to be a history teacher. Yeah, I loved I loved history. Um, just Obviously, the military kind of leads into a lot of yeah. history and you learn a lot of military history when you're in the military. Yeah. But uh, then I went and did a master's at Harvard for international education because okay. I wanted to work in the international field, especially like conflict education. So I think it's interesting mm-hmm. how, um, you know, it's tough to go to school in a war zone and yeah. then how that impacts you. Yeah, totally. OK, so you obviously transitioning out, you had some some sort of expectation as far as what that transfer from active duty military, you know, combat tourists in Afghanistan to sitting in a classroom with a bunch of 18 year olds, you had something in your mind <laughs> and tried to prepare for that. Uh, and I, I would, I would venture to guess that based off writing the book, you were shocked and you were like, okay, 
so, somebody needs to warn these people. <laughs> yeah, I saw a real need for it. That's, <laughs> so I, I, I picked up a part-time job working for the VA, helping student veterans, like yeah. certifying benefits, doing paperwork and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then I was going through my experiences in the classroom that, you know, are, are so many, like the cursing thing I mentioned. Also, I remember coming in with a classroom with my assault pack, because that's what you called it, was an assault pack. Yeah. And like <laughs> I put it down, uh, put it down next to me. And the girl next to me was like frightened. She was like, oh, that they had like mag pouches on it and stuff like that. Oh, wow, okay. just, you know, and she's like, <laughs> and then yeah. so everyone thought I was like a future school shooter or something. Yeah, yeah. So it was, look. Yeah, it was it was tough. But and I saw this different things that veterans struggled with. I saw the difficulty transitioning and I saw because when you're a student veteran, like you mentioned, chances are you're older, you're not traditional. Over 50 percent of student veterans have some kind of service connected disability. So there's specific challenges you face as well as needing employment. Most of them and the majority of us have families. Or like me, you're divorced. Yeah. So, you know, that you, you're you carrying a lot more baggage mm. into the classroom than your traditional 18-year-old. So at first I made a list and I was giving it out to other student veterans that were in my school called John's College Tips. Mm. And then those tips eventually morphed into the chapters of the book. So it's kind of oh, like okay. organic, really straightforward. Like cool. I didn't, enough people were like, do you just write a book? Because I was taking veterans around the school you know, just showing them this is career services. This is where you hand in papers. This is, you know, all these kind of like strategies on how to be successful at college. And then so the writing the book kind of came naturally because of some I was doing at the time where yeah. I could really see a lot of the missteps that veterans make totally. and some of the things you can do to overcome them. What what school did you immediately go to following? I went to uh, St. Joseph's College in New York, which is a small yeah. private school with a yeah. really good um, veterans program. So okay. one of the things that, you know, when you when you're getting out of the military, it's I want to go to college, which is a great idea. But what college and for mm. what? So yeah. I had a pretty clear path and you think that helped me out a lot. I yeah. still think college is a place of uh, self-discovery for veterans like it is normal people. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, even if you don't know what you want to do. College is a decent place to figure that out for veterans when you get out of the military. Yeah. Because I see a lot of veterans now in my work who don't want to go to school because they don't know what they want to do. So they just don't go to college and they pick up some job that they don't have any passion or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. And with the opportunity to go to school for free and kind of get paid when you're doing it, yeah. you might as well go ahead and go to school and figure some things out, network and stuff like that, opposed to just taking a job at a gas station or something because you don't know what you want to do in college. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, my, my whole idea behind my podcast and my YouTube channel is to help veterans, you know, leverage the benefits that they've earned and make the most out of it. And so I ha- like, I agree with you so much, but also to an extent, I, I have seen so many veterans that start going to college, they use their GI bill and they're like constantly changing their program. And then they run mm-hmm. out of benefits before they get anywhere. And it's like, you know, there's such a fine line between, you know, using the benefits, kind of figuring out along the way and using the benefits, but, but jumping programs, jumping schools to where like you could really put yourself in a crap situation where after two years of jumping around, you find out like, oh, now I know where I want to go, right. but I don't have enough benefits to get me there. So it, there's such a fine line, it's such a, like, it's such a hard thing to really narrow down for each individual because each one is is so different um yeah and sometimes the approach is you have to have some type of strategy to it but yeah. nowadays a lot of places like sometimes it's like hey they want to see you have a degree they don't really care mm-hmm. what it's in so yeah. get a degree so college is more the place where you can become the best version of yourself if you do it right but you're right there's certainly a lot of strategy that needs to go into it. And you hear those stories about veterans who are just, they mm-hmm. get to college and they get more lost because they're not sure what to do. And that's mm-hmm. why my book has kind of practical advice on how to find a mentor, you know, yes. how to things like that, where you're really used to the mentorship role. Yes. But another thing I recommend veterans do is to mentor someone yourself. Yeah. It's kind of like you're used to that in the military and that puts you in a role model position. Totally. Totally. Yeah. No, I, I was reading that part last night and I think that, yeah, both of those points are really good. Finding a mentor and being a mentor where you're you're kind of forced in those positions in the military, you know, like rank up, rank down. There's mm-hmm. always somebody that you're either looking up to or, or helping out. And so to to organically build those relationships is not nearly as as easy as you would think while in the military. 
And so I think, yeah, you know, definitely reading your book and uh, doing additional research on how to develop those relationships. Um, and I think that, you know, you're going to get almost, you're going to get more out of helping somebody else than you are getting helped by somebody else. If, that, if I just yeah. said that right. Um, I think it's really easy to overlook that, but how much, putting yourself in a role model position yeah. and kind of setting an example for someone improves your life. Sure. Um, you know, I had a mentor, like my mentor really gave me super practical advice because they asked me things like, you know, tell me your daily routine. And I didn't have one, but I had mm. one in the military and mm. I was successful in that daily routine, in the military. So, yeah. okay, let's develop a daily routine. And then there's little things in daily routine. Like my mentor is like, Hey, read for an hour a day, look out for an hour a day and start every morning with a motivational video. Mm. And I was like, okay, you know, yeah. like those are three things I could manage every day. Um, and then kind of carrying that forward into my life totally transformed me as a person. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's again, it's like the things that we're, we're forced to do in the military that we take for granted for. Mm -hmm. And we assume it's just going to be part of life when we get out. And then when yeah, it's no not, one's going to kick down like, your door and tell you to go to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden so, everything's optional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a lot of people think that the military is complicated when that's not, mm -hmm. that's not the case at all. You know, I love the scene in Forrest Gump where, uh, he's like, uh, the drill sergeant screaming at him. He goes, what are you doing in the military for us? And he goes, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do drill sergeant. And mm -hmm. that's really it. You know, yeah. you wake up, you work hard, you listen to the person in charge of you, and you're going to be successful. Whereas yeah. civilian world is kind of more chaotic. It's all over the place. There's no structure. There's no blueprint. Whereas yeah. in the military, there's kind of a linear path set out for you, and you know what you need to do, you need to, do to be successful. Yeah. But now with the individualism, with technology in the civilian world, veterans are kind of coming into an unpredictable job sector. Mm, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, allude it, you allude to your, your combat experience several times throughout your book. And, and, you know, obviously as the, the GWAT era has pretty much wrapped up, um, fewer and fewer veterans are combat veterans. Um, uh, but even then we still have our unique experiences. We, we still have this like wide divide between us and the rest of the student pool and the population. And I just feel like so many people kind of like, they almost like enjoy that gap, even though it only hurts mm -hmm. them, you know, and they, they like further build that divide and isolate themselves. Um, and so it sounds like, you know, you've been through some, some definite stuff through your combat tours. And how did you navigate that divide and, and prevent that from, you know, being something that isolates you? I think it's easy. It's easier nowadays, or it feels easy to kind of become an anti-civilian veteran. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you always hear veterans complaining about oh. civilians, you never hear veterans or civilians complain about veterans. Yeah. And I think that we isolate ourselves as much as society isolates us. Mm. We've kind of kept civilians at arm length. And, yeah. you know, I think that they've done it a little bit as, you know, as well, too. It's hard to understand how over 20 years of a war that we become further disconnected from our civilian population, you know, mm -hmm. but it certainly happened. So yeah. one way that I think veterans can kind of work on that is we have to take the first step because they're not going to. Yeah. And one of those things is to tell our stories, like mm -hmm. stuff like this. You have to get out and you have to share your stories because it humanizes you. A lot of civilians look at us as so different from them. When of course we're not, we're just joined the yeah. military and worked on doing a tough job. For me, I thought it was weird how, the kind of dichotomy of how civilians view you as some type of GI Joe superhero mm. when you're serving. And then when you get out, they look at you like you're some PTSD filled yeah. homeless veteran <laughs> ready to crack or something like that. Yeah. I was yeah. surprised when people like felt sorry for me, you know, mm. when I, of when I was going through a little bit of my struggles or whatever, because the worst thing that I think veterans develop is self pity. I think mm. when veterans start feeling sorry for themselves totally. and the military is such an easy thing or the VA to point at that, like, oh, that's why I'm screwed up. And that kind of leads more into isolation because yeah. we've seen isolation is more dangerous to veterans than combat. Yeah. Yeah. hundred, hundred percent. Um, in, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of chapter five specifically, with, you know, of a title, don't be afraid to look stupid. I mean, this <laughs> isn't, this isn't totally in line with, with, you know, maybe I'm going off a little bit, but I think that there's a, there's a, you know, when you're saying tell your story, there's, there's two components to telling a story. There's the civilian who 
if they're un, unaffiliated complete with the military, they're going to like really be like, wow, that's, that's a wild story. But then at the same time, there's that vet in the back of the classroom who's totally crapping on you for <laughs> telling your veteran story, you know? <laughs> so there's like, there, there's that, you know, that conflict of like, okay, I still want to like stay true to my veterans, but I also feel like I got to share my story, but I want every, every veteran in the back of the room thinking I'm a douche that. Yeah. That you're a bro can't. vet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so those are just kind of like the constant things that, you know, that you got to figure out. And I think that's a lot of that has to do with your attitude, um, and how you're presenting your story. But what, what's your, what's your take on that? I think a lot of student veterans, you see some that, you know, really downplay their student identity or student veteran or your veteran identity, mm. like you mentioned, and some upplay it. And it is mm. easy to look at the guy who plays hard, his veteran identity, go, yeah. dude, what are you doing? Like, you're yeah. trying to get that. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah. which, you know, you're trying to hear that a few times a day. And that's great. Uh-huh. And I think how we portray ourselves to the American people does make a difference yeah. because I remember I was at the gym, you know, a few weeks ago and there's this veteran there and he's got his dog tags outside of his shirt. Mm-hmm. He's got his, you know, veteran hat on veteran yeah. shirt on, and he's got like a service dog with him there mm-hmm. in the squat rack. And, you know, I'm wearing like a black rifle shirt or something. And he yeah. comes up and he's like, Hey, were you in the military? And I was like, yeah. yeah. And he tells me I was in the air force for three years. And, uh, you know, I went to Kuwait for six months gotcha. and I, I looked at it. I looked at him. I was like, why do you have, you know, why do you have a service dog? Mm-hmm. And he goes, Oh, just a PTSD for military training. And I don't know how training, you know, the air force is like, I'm sure it can't be that tough, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think how we portray ourselves yeah. to the population needs, needs work because we don't want to be looked at as victims or pitied we want yeah. to be role models, continue to set the standard and continue serving, uh, you yeah. know, even after we're done in the military. Yeah, totally. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, how, what do you think is, was your biggest surprise going from, from active duty military into college? I'd say the total disconnect that most people had with the military, like you were okay. mentioned, like people being unaffiliated mm-hmm. and then you look further into it, you found out that 80% of the military comes from military families. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who didn't know a single veteran. So mm-hmm. I was the only veteran that they had ever met in their entire lives. And certainly the only combat veteran, you know, if you don't have a military family, especially where I was at in New York. And I think, I was a little surprised at that. And then also kind of made me feel a responsibility because to them, I'm the military, like they don't know anything else. So I think, you know, it, it made me feel like, Oh, I want to represent the military better and not like a total idiot. Like sometimes I do. So it kind of made me feel like, Oh, I want to, you know, be a good standard bearer for the people serving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of a, yeah, a weighty position to take. <laughs> if you're you're basically yeah those people's only um, experience with the military and and whatever you you know put off is your is kind of what they're gonna live with. Gonna yeah. So if I'm giving off that douche or every disgruntled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. So I think a lot of people are scared because they they view questioning the military or its use or asking anything mm-hmm. about the country as they might be perceived as anti-veteran or unpatriotic or something like that when we want the civilian population comfortable asking questions to us and about us you know i think the civilian population has kind of fallen back and looked to government to deal with the military and that's Mm -hmm. why you know veteran issues never really become much of an issue or the wars because the people just looked at the government to use the military yeah yeah 100 percent um, I'm looking, I, I made note of a quote you had in the book. Um, and I, I put down too many quotes apparently, cause I can't find this one, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that it, that what you were talking about, how you were shocked at how many people, you know, how many active duty members think that they're going to get out and get that six figure job. And it's so funny. Cause like, for whatever reason, it's like, it's always six figures. Like yeah, a hundred <laughs> grand is like a magic number where everybody's going to be happy somehow. I don't know. Um, but yeah, everybody in active duty is always like, oh, like with my like TS or my, you know, NCO experience, whatever, like six figure jobs can be so easy to get, you know, no worries. I don't, I don't need a college. And I, I appreciate that you mentioned that because it is just like somehow <laughs> an expectation <laughs> when you get out, here's your check, here's your job. 
Yeah, a lot of people think they're going to stroll right into some amazing job because yeah. they had served in the military. But the yeah. military is far from a golden ticket in life. If anything, it's something that can be used. But it, I don't yeah. know. I think, I mean, being a, a veteran starting over is is harder than most things because you have so much stuff that you're taking with you. You have so much bag, or you you know you can have so much baggage, and it's hard sometimes. I think we tend to look at our military experiences in a negative light and not kind of think about the advantages that our military training and experiences have, you know, because for starters, you know, like I mentioned in the book, you know, veterans know how to be on time. Veterans understand how to work hard. And those things have kind of fallen further and further from general American society. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, just to, you know, I don't want to scare people, <laughs> but at the same time, when I'm like, you know, if you're essentially, unless you have, you know, a degree, unless you're an officer really, or like a very specialized Intel or uh, something that else that you can directly translate into, you know, whether it be a government or private sector position, you pr- you are pretty much starting over whether or not you go mm-hmm. to college or get a career, the chances are you're starting over. And nobody is going to st- start you off at a hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars. I mean, I, I remember when I was looking for jobs early on after getting out, it was like, you know, I'd be lucky to get like 50, 50 K right. like with a, my random like MOS experience that doesn't mean anything anywhere. <laughs> um, it's just like, I'm totally changing industries. I'm totally, you know, yes, I have these intangible things that I can, that I can put on my resume and I can speak to if I'm lucky enough to get an interview. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think so many people just expect, let me, you know, drop five applications. I'll get five interviews. I'll have my pick. And I was just talking to somebody the other day. He's, he submitted like 79 applications and had two interviews. And it's just like, it's not quite as straightforward as. <laughs> as yeah. And those are actually a pretty good rates to get submit 79 and get two back. A lot of yeah. you are even, even more than that. It's interesting. You mentioned the uh, officer thing because one of the reasons I wanted to write this book and I felt like it was important is you have mm-hmm. kind of two classes of people totally. yep. in the military. You have officers and you have enlisted. And we have basically, I don't want to say, you know, the same call it, the same military experiences, but we're on the same basis. We eat the same food. We have access mm-hmm. to the same benefits. We wear the same uniform, all that stuff. Yeah. And officers uh, transition so much better on the military. Mm-hmm. They, they make more money. They struggle less with PTSD. They get divorced less. They struggle less mm-hmm. with alcoholism and things like that. And the big difference between, you know, officers enlisted is a college degree. So mm-hmm. they're getting out with a college degree and their military experience. And veterans are only getting out with their military experience. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people look at that as more of a handicap than an asset in the corporate mm-hmm. world. They look at you, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. They might look at you like being hardworking and a team player, they also might view as like a ticket time bomb yeah. or waiting to yeah. go off for having PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with, you know, the, the new, the new, um, transitioned veterans, newly transitioned. And, and I, you know, I don't know, I'd, I'd be curious from a, an employer's perspective, I, you know, like I think there, for some, there are kind of negative, um, perspectives that are coming on. Mm-hmm. For veterans like okay veterans that are newly transitioned they don't really know what they want they're just trying to get a job they're not going to be here for like five years you know maybe six months to a year and so i think after um you know the gy era you're you're almost like you're getting out now you're almost battling against kind of a mixed bag of reputations that veterans before you have set and so um you have to really like present yourself well and build your own um reputation that you can you know rely on and whether that be building the reputation while you're in so you're getting good letter of recommendations you're getting you know warm handoffs and warm introductions to people at companies where you can you know you're not just a random application to land on the desk Uh, i think that so much the work starts well before you actually get that dd214 yeah i mean I, i i gave a speech to some uh you know uh reserve soldiers or, you know, who are in. And I was like, how many people are planning on getting out of the military? And only a few raised their hands. And I was like, everyone should have raised their hands because everyone's getting out of the military. Mm, Unless you die, you know, in service, you're getting out of the military. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, five years from now, tomorrow or 20 years from now, you're getting out of the military and you're going to have to figure that out. And, you know, 
the day you start preparing is when you realize that's going to happen. Yeah. I think that more people nowadays are going to be finding jobs based on networking and who they know mm. opposed to what they know. Because when you get out of the military as a veteran, there's a chance you might not know that much other than, like you said, your specific MOS, your military skills, and yeah. that can be looked at as much of a handicap as an advantage into this world. Totally, totally. Yeah, I was just watching a, a video on YouTube, uh, Patrick by David. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, entrepreneur, big fan. He was in the army actually many moons ago. <laughs> uh, but he was talking about how like, you know, sending his kids to school. If if he were to, if his kids wanted to go to school, go to college, he would let them. But he would say, if you're going to college, then here's what you need to do. You know, 2.0 is essentially the same as 4.0, which debatable. But he's like, I would tell you to go to school and find out who are the kids of the wealthiest parents and go network <laughs> with them, you know, because it is really, it's all about who, you know, and not what, you know, and if you get that diploma with your name on it, saying you have a bachelor's degree, like nobody is ever going to ask you unless you're applying to grad school, nobody's going to ask you what your GPA was. Nobody really cares. You know, they care if you can do the job, they care if you know the right people and really knowing the right people is going to get you the job. So, mm -hmm. And college is a great place to meet people. I mean, so. that's one of the places, you know, the military is not a super great place all the time for networking because a lot of the people are staying in, like you mentioned, yeah. it's good for developed yeah. relationships, for letters of recommendation and things like that. Like I had, you know, my company commander was with me, you know, letter of recommendation, but he's yeah. still in the military. So he's yeah. not going to be able to hook me up with a job outside the military. Sure. So I think we're, we're so likely and comfortable in our military bubbles that we stay within them too much for things like networking when really we need to find ways to get uncomfortable in our networking mm -hmm. and put ourselves out there in the world more yeah yeah because the job's not coming to you you got to go out and get it it ain't coming to you yeah no it's not and, coming to you and neither of those stimmy checks anymore so you got you no. got to figure it out one way or another and um, a lot of people you know what's the federal resume thing like oh i'll put my resume online mm -hmm. people will People will pursue me like, dude, you're not like an NFL free agent yeah, it's yeah. Not like that. Yeah. There are plenty of qualified people yeah. for any any desirable position mm -hmm. how you separate yourself, you know, and that's why in my book, I recommend things like how do you find internships? Because yeah. that's a big that's a big thing to do. Totally. How can you set yourself apart from other people on your resume? Yeah. How can you? forge connections in your community? Because like you like you said earlier, another big thing with veterans is when we get out we usually don't stay in the same place we're at. We move mm. across the country or the entire world, which makes you kind of in a starting over position. Totally. Totally. Yeah. You've got that, that, um, chapter four, I'm too old to be starting over, which I think, I mean, I think everybody has that thought uh, a couple of times <laughs> during their transition yeah. and they think, man, I should have just stayed in. Like, at least I wouldn't right. be starting over. <laughs> I might be unhappy, but at least I wouldn't be starting over. Um, and you know, that's just, life is full of starting overs, you know? And, and I think once you come to terms with that, that like you're just constantly starting over because whether it be a new job, new relationship, new town, whatever, like you're constantly starting over. So who really cares what age you are? Cause you're going to be doing it again in 10 years, you know? Yeah. I think that's super good advice to view every, every day as a fresh start. Um, and I think you're right. When I was in the military, I'm like, oh, I should get out and I'm out. I should be like, oh, I should go back in. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if yeah. you're constantly viewing yourself on a path to improvement, mm -hmm. which is why I recognize that traditional school classroom is not for everybody. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not like, Hey, every veteran needs to get out and go straight to college. Cause it's not always, you know, what you should do, yeah. but a lifelong learning is important for everyone. Despite, you know, you, you're probably going to learn more on podcasts than you are than the classroom. Okay. And I probably learn more like watching podcasts and than I did at Harvard. You know, I mean, it's not yeah. like it's, there's so many ways to learn now and veterans need to keep growing. The military forces you to grow. And it's kind of part of the process. They send you schools and promote you. They give you more responsibility. But in the civilian world, you have to find your own growth. You have to find your own challenges. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Honestly, man, I mean, going through your book, it is, it's a, a small investment in your future, really. I mean, between the cost of the book and the time it's going to take you to read it. I mean, it's not tremendously long, what, 12 chapters? Yeah, it's like 150 pages. So I wanted to make it short because, you know, I, I don't Hopefully think anyone audience. wants to read <laughs> an essay. You know, my goal is kind of be, I want to be useful, firstly, uh, entertaining and helpful. Like, yeah. you know, that's kind of, kind of it. Yeah. Where, where do you hope to go from here? I mean, what's your, what's your goal at this point? And how do you hope to build on your combat to college 
book. So now I uh, just finished the first draft of next book, which I'm hoping is going to be the one that's going to kind of set me, uh, you know, set me on to the next level. And now I'm having a good time writing for a few different military publications online and kind of continuing, continue on down that path. So I have my website with my blog where I post, you know, articles, tips, things like that, you know, articles on there, but I network as a student veteran, ancient therapy, um, you yeah. know, all these things that I'm into, um, so right now I'm really just working on how to grow my voice to be a bigger impact in the future for veterans. Awesome. Awesome. I like that, man. Yeah. It's a, it's a worthy cause for sure. Cause there's obviously lots of veterans that struggle on their way out and um, you know, the more help that they can get, the more, you know, mentor that they can have, I think the better off the community will be. So that's yeah, that, that first year is, is so important. I think people kind of, Think like, oh, you got forever to figure it out. You just got out of the military. But, but that first year really sets the tone for your life. So yeah. you got to hit the, you, you kind of got to hit the ground running. I'm not saying don't take a break, don't take a vacation. Yeah. But that first year really develops some momentum for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Awesome, John. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. I'm going to make sure that the link to your book on Amazon, unless you prefer it somewhere else. Yeah, Amazon's good. Perfect. Or you can buy it on my website too. Okay. I'll make, I'll put the link to both and people can, and can pick, um, but definitely check out combat to college. I mean, if you're, whether or not you're in college right now using the GI bill or you're nearing that transition, I mean, it's a, it's a no brainer. Like you're going to have to read a bunch in college. Anyways, you might start, might as well start warming up your brain and figuring out like, okay, how can I make the most of this experience and ensure my success in the future? And so I think John lays it out step-by-step and uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of the book, so I appreciate you putting that out. Thanks. I appreciate it. It was awesome coming on and talking, Jason. Absolutely, man. Where can people connect with you other than your book? So uh, my website, johnhdaviswriter.com or Instagram, you know, John H. Davis Writer. You can reach out to me on there. Uh, any questions you have, I do, you know, some speaking events for student veteran groups and things like that. But, you know, anyone who has any questions, I have a lot of articles on a lot of different things because awesome. I think that you know, pursuing different forms of therapy or a more personalized way of therapy is better route than, you know, maybe where, where you're going to get the VA. Mm, mm, I like it. I like it. Awesome, man. Well, I look forward to uh, watching you grow and, you know, continue to help veterans. And uh, I look forward to that next book coming out. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'll come on and talk about it. <laughs> Sounds great, man. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with John. Um, I, I can't recommend enough to actually just just use the link below, purchase his book. It's super cheap and it's really not long. I mean, you can read it in an afternoon if you put your mind to it. And I think the value that comes out of the book, uh, if you are currently using your GI Bill as a student veteran or about to be, I would, this, this book is, is for you. And so don't miss out on the opportunity. Uh, the value is there and it just requires a couple bucks and a couple hours. And so I highly recommend you check it out. But with all that said, I hope you guys enjoyed, uh, check out the links in the description and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.